Speaker and Mr. Franks, uh, I thought was, was, it was interesting that those individuals in the last two weeks talk, talked about the subject of lying. And this, while this message is not a subject on lying, there is an element that, that deals with that. We're in a world that, as, as we know, we see conflict everywhere. I want to ask this question of, of you as we hear this term. This term I, I've begun to hear more and more frequently. I, I think I probably started really catching this phrase uh, a good two or three years ago, but I hear it almost every week now uh, in, in, as I listen, to, listen or watch different media. But one of the questions that they're always talking about is controlling the narrative. How many of you have uh, hear that from you know who who controls the narrative? How many of you hear that phrase? Uh, it, it is it is all about us, and and I never had heard it as much as as now. It's all about controlling the mer narrative. Who controls the narrative? Who controls the story in terms of of explaining what's going on? Who it's all about setting the narrative. You hear that even in business. Uh, we, you know, to, to sell this product or, or to create an interest to buy, you've got we've got to create the narrative. We've got to create the story to to get this get this person oriented towards this direction to purchase this product. But who controls the narrative? Who controls the narrative in your life? Who controls the narrative in my life? So many things that we see going on at present with the whole situation, do we need to go through it? Again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of these, but, but think of each of these topics that are going on that are raging right now, just in our country, let alone around the world, and the different efforts that are, that are put forward to control the narrative, to control the story of what's really going on. What's really going on in conservatism Conservatism versus socialism. Uh, conservatism versus leftism or, or, or liberalism. Uh, the, the discussions that go on there. The whole uh, situation that we're seeing with uh, moral relativism versus mor moral absolutes. What, from what, from who controls the narrative of, of how we get to where we are with some of these things? Climate change, when we, when we listen to that and we listen to the discussions that are out there, we've talked about this before, but there are scientists that say it is so obvious that climate change is happening. And there are others that are saying, well, yes, there's, there's some climate change, but this has been the story ever since, you know, the, the world has been. There have been times of cold, times of heat. We said the earth was going to freeze over. We said the earth was going to melt and all the oceans were, uh, you know, were going to rise and, and kill us all. You know, it, 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 always back and forth. You know, what, what is it? Is, is it global warming or is it, or is it climate change? Uh, is, are these fires that are happening out in, in California, are they as a result of climate change? Are they as a result of a cyclical thing that happens? Are they the result of improper uh, forestry methods to where this happens? Are, are they the result of what naturally occurs? Uh, all of these, these kinds of things, is it mankind's fault that man, man is there and as a result we're having these fires that are taking over? But, but it's, it's all about the narrative that each person sets. We think of social justice. Uh, we think of the, the whole situation of the racial superiority situation, racial supremacy, critical race theory, all of these kinds of things. There is a narrative that is set. And there is a narrative that's set in, in some educational settings, and then in other educational settings, they set up a completely different narrative to discuss the situation. What is the, what is the true narrative? Who controls the narrative? And, and for us, as we listen to all that's going on in this world, to, to what narrative do we listen most closely? It is difficult, it is difficult to sift through the, the information that is out there on all of these kinds of things. We, we talk about the whole subject of revisionist history, uh, the, the founding of this nation. Was it built on the back of slaves? Was it, is it all about uh, the, the story of, of slavery, just another form of slavery, another form of slavery, and here we are, the white uh, supremacy uh, uh, over the, the Latins, over the blacks, uh, what, what, what is this over the Native Americans? Is it all about uh, white supremacy? Are, are whites 
uh, just because by virtue of being white do we not understand the degree to which we are prejudiced. You know, all of these things uh, uh, are, are out there, and, 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 it, and it hits us from all levels. It, it hits us viscerally. If, 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 if I'm a black man, if I were a black woman, if I were a Hispanic person, uh, knowing my story of, of, of how I came to this country and the things that I have endured, your personal experience is real. And as a result of that, it has created to some degree a narrative in your life just as, as that narrative has been created in my life of, of what I have experienced. But, but who controls the narrative? Who controls the narrative for you and me in terms of how we view what's going on around us? Critical. It is so critical as, as we move forward because there are many forces striving to control that narrative. I, I was thinking but before we get to, well, the, the title uh, is uh, Who Frames the Narrative in Your Life? That, that's the title of the message, Who Frames the Narrative in Your Life? Before we jump into this, let's just talk about Nazism, okay? Nazism uh, and the, the regime that, that Adolf Hitler established and what he was able to do in essence, in its, at its very core, was a controlling of the narrative. Uh, as, as we know, uh, because of the, the edict uh, placed upon uh, the, the terms of, of armistice that occurred uh, through World War I, the, the oppression that the Germans were under uh, was so great that they, they couldn't rise out of that. And it was causing incredible frustration on every level of society in the German nation. So the German nation was ripe for a person to come on, along and create a narrative of why this situation uh, is the way it is in which we find ourselves. And, and, and uh, again, Adolf Hitler had, had many angles, but, but one of the angles was it is, look, look at these people over here. We've got, we've got Jews and we've got other inferior, uh, inferior kinds of individuals uh, that they lumped all together. We need to take care of that population, get them out, they are the root of all of that. And he created a narrative uh, as a dynamic individual that, that people believed that and followed through with that. I, I think it's fascinating to look at, 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 at today's society. You listen to talk radio, you listen to uh, NPR, you, wh whatever side uh, of, of the aisle you listen to, but both will, will say things about Nazism, how the conservatives, they, these are Nazi kinds of strategies. It, it's almost Adolf Hitler-like. Uh, the, the, the programs over here that we're doing, that we're seeing happen in, uh, on, on the left is, 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 uh, is fascist. It's, it's, it's almost Hitler-like in what, the, you know, so it's, it's, people are striving to control the narrative, to create a situation in our minds where we side with this or that. Who controls the narrative? I want to, uh, before we get into details, I want, I want to uh, read from an article in Psychology Today. It, it's titled, Regaining Control of the Narrative, Rewrite Your Present and Future by Christy Lee Hockenberger, uh, February 22, 2020. Now, this particular article deals with the subject of narcissism. And the sermon today is not about narcissism, but it defines uh, this this, this concept of, of narcissism and the way that a narcissist views life and how a narcissist's, whoa, narcissists, I, I'm going to say that several times here, I've got to make sure I get that down, uh, how a narcissist's toolbox works. I quote, one of the most important tools in a narcissist's toolbox is the ability to control the narrative. Manipulation is a key trait of individuals with controlling personalities. Call it gaslighting, call it whitewashing, rewriting the script. The crux of the matter is the manipulator's desire to control the narrative and either be the hero or the victim. I'm going to create the narrative here to put myself in the position of, of being a hero who, who is there to save the day in, in these situations, or even the victim. I, I've been victimized, so to control that. 
He says, uh, she says, chances are if you're reading this blog, you're involved in a narcissist's rewrite of history. Controlling the narrative is just one universal tactic of clinical and non-clinical narcissists. Statistically speaking, clinical narcissists only make up a very small percentage of the population, and the large majority of those diagnosed are men. However, women can also be very skillful narcissists and manipulators. When accounting for individuals with undiagnosed clinical narcissism or those merely displaying a few traits, it's impossible to know the true percentage of narcissism in today's world. For the purpose of this blog, narcissist and narcissism will be used as all-encompassing terms to describe those actively and consciously hurting others. A few more paragraphs here. Like narcissism, males are generally, generally more likely to be the gaslighter than the gaslightee, but women can also wield power. No matter who is controlling the narrative, the one in control is depriving the other individual of respect, social power, and the ability to define reality. A narcissist is, is controlling the narrative with that individual which they are manipulating to, to cause that person to come to a point where he or she is unable to accurately define reality in a situation, the realness of a situation. Keep in mind at the core of a narcissist is cripplingly low self-esteem. They will do anything possible to not just build, them, build themselves up, but also to put others down. When a narcissist's partner, be it a romantic, familial, or business partner, is seen as asserting themselves or gaining power, the narcissist will respond negatively. This is a great opportunity for gaslighting and regaining, regaining control of the story. Narcissists and similar egomaniacs are incredibly sensitive to criticism and, and any indication they are slipping in importance. They feel entitled to power, status, and whatever they deem necessary, money, attention, gifts, advancements, etc. If a manipulator is sensing that he or she is losing this, this friend, lover, or influence at work even, they will do anything necessary to regain that power, including rewriting the story. Controlling the narrative can be beneficial for the manipulator for many reasons. They can decide whether they are the hero deserving praise or whether they're the victim in need of sympathy. In either situation, the accompanying actor is the villain. They make that other person, uh, they tend to make that other person the villain. Again, this, this message is not about narcissism. Uh, this message is about controlling the narrative. Controlling the narrative is a term that we've seen uh, in, in vogue here recently, but where does uh, controlling the narrative originate? I don't think it takes too much to, to reflect on where that is derived. Let's take a look at uh, a couple of passages to speak to this, uh, which speak to this. Uh, so many things that we can learn from Genesis, and uh, some of you were ahead of me. Uh, especially as, as we heard these re re referenced in, in the most uh, recent two messages. But, but think about this from the standpoint of the battle that's going on, the battle that's raging in society on all kinds of different levels uh, from this, this tree that is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The, the, the battle to control the narratives even within that tree that's going on, let alone the, the bigger battle in our lives to control the narrative from the standpoint of the tree of life versus the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3, we see this, this being, this serpent, begin to change the narrative. Uh, verse, verse, three, this, verse 1, this cunning serpent who was more cunning than any beast of the field. This beast, as, as he began to work with Eve, was striving to get her to change the narrative, to, to think about it from a different perspective. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God, did God say this? 
did, did he say this? And so she's thinking, well, well yes, yes, he, he said this. So it got, got her questioning initially. The narrative was set. God, God told them that uh, dying you shall die if you eat of the, verse 17, chapter 2, dying you shall die if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't, don't eat it. And we don't know the other details that God would have shared with them. It's, it's a summary statement here. But God set the narrative. Here, here is what you can do and here is what you cannot do. But, but he tries to change that. And she answers according to the narrative that God had given her. But, and, and finishes that statement in verse 3, and then he says, he changes the narrative. Verse 4, the serpent said, no, 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 wait a second. You, you won't, you're not going to die. That, that's not incorrect. Uh, God is coming at this from a completely wrong narrative. The, the true narrative is that when you take of this, you're going to know both good and evil. It, your eyes are going to be open. You're, you're, you'll be like God, in fact, knowing good and evil. So then, by his ability to change that narrative in her mind and to get her to start considering that, she began to reason through that, and, and it, made, it made sense. It made sense based on the narrative that this, this beast was beginning to, to share uh, with her, and she, she then succumbed. We see the other controlling of the narrative situation in a passage which was also read in, in at least one of the two messages last time. Let's go there uh, just as a review, Matthew 4. Matthew 4, as we see the temptation that Satan provides for Jesus Christ. Matthew 4. It's, I'm not going to say it's all about the narrative that he was trying to establish, but, but think about that concept with respect to what he's doing here with Christ. Jesus Christ knows the narrative. What is the narrative? The narrative, Jesus Christ knows the story. He knows the accuracy of, of the trueness of the story of what's really going on. Jesus Christ is love. Jesus Christ is truth. I am the truth and the way. He's there, and he's the one who created uh, this being that turned. He sees it all. He knows the whole plan. And yet, this great deceiver is still trying to get him to change the narrative, to think of it from a completely different perspective. The, the first temptation, man shall, uh, he says here, uh, the tempter came to him, verse 3, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Uh, so, you know, here, here he's, he's trying to get him to change that narrative. No, Jesus Christ, wait a second. I, I am the Son of God. It's not an if I am the Son of God. And, and I don't need to do anything, even if there's nothing wrong with changing, uh, deciding here's a stone, and I, I'll change that. I'll, I'll change that to bread. He could do that if he wanted to. But, but he recognized the narrative in which uh, Satan was coming from. Are, are, are you really this? If you're really this, then you need to prove it to me, Jesus, that you're the Son of God. Prove it. Prove it. I, 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 are you really? You're here flesh and blood. Are you really the son of God? I mean, he's, he's filled with lies. So he's, he's working this angle on him and, and trying to get Christ uh, to, to say, you know, all right, I'll show him. I'll show him I'm the son of God. I'll, I'll change this. I'll change this. Jesus Christ, who understood the narrative, who understood what life is, that life is from the true bread from heaven, Life is complete contact with God on every level. This, this life is temporary, and in fact, I've come here to give up my life because this is the narrative. This is the true narrative of the plan of God, is for me to come and, and fully commit to God, completely to do His will, so that I can be a perfect sacrifice for the sins of all of mankind. That is the narrative that I'm locked on. So this guy comes in here and tries to change this narrative about this? No. No, I reject that. He rejected it clearly. He rejected it in the second instance, as, as he said, uh, you, know, you know, fall, fall, and, and, and watch if you're the son of God, if you truly are. It's written, the, the angels have charge over you. Yes, that is a narrative that, that he's trying to create here, that if you really who you are, then the angels will, will come to your aid and, and, and capture you. And changing that narrative, no, no, you are not going to do that to me, Satan. I am not thinking in that realm. Number one, I am the Son of God. 
I am the Son of God, and I have come to do God's will. I will serve him faithfully, and I will die for all of mankind. I am not going to yield to this. We come to the third one. You're, you're on the high mountain, and he's showing him all the kingdoms of this world, all of them. Here's the narrative. Here's the narrative. I'm going to let you rule over all of these things. Did he have the power to do so? Of course he did. He was the God, he was the God of this world. He rules the nations. He, he could offer Jesus Christ that. So if Jesus Christ pulled back and thought about that, wow, I, I, can, I can effect change here as as the person who is ruler over the nations, I can start beginning to effect change on this earth by having an influence that, that Satan allows me to do. Here I am in the flesh. I can take on that role, and I can begin to effect positive change for mankind if he follows the narrative that, that Satan is, is trying to get him to, to go down that path. Jesus Christ said, no, I am worshiping God. I am fulfilling God's will. I know, yes, you are the God of this world. I, I created you. You turned. You have this authority. This authority that you have, Satan, is temporary. It is not lasting. I am from the eternal one. I am eternal. I was e eternal. I gave that up to come here and be flesh and blood, and I will go back to the Father and dwell with him for eternity and bring all of mankind into this family for eternity, and you will be cast out. Why, why would I do something like that? He always kept things in the narrative of, of, of God's narrative. He did not let Satan get in the way. Job 1. No, actually, let's go to Romans 1. Let's go to Romans 1, and then we'll go to Job. These are four major ones. But, but think about all four of these from the standpoint of the narrative. I, uh, I, I watched, I didn't watch, I listened. I sometimes listen to NPR. I think I've quoted from, from this particular show uh, occasionally. It's called Think. And, by, uh, and it's uh, hosted by Chris Boyd, I believe, and it's actually uh, out of uh, Dallas here. And they, they play uh, usually a half hour, uh, no, it's usually two back-to-back one-hour uh, one programs, uh, uh, five days a week. And I'll, I'll catch it sometimes when I'm on the road to visits and, and counseling. But I, I, uh, I heard this one, it was, it was this past July, there was a fellow who's a research journalist who... Uh, specializes in speech, and I can't remember if it, it, what, what period in July it was that I happened to catch this show, but it was, it was really fascinating because as it, as it started, this, this uh, speech research uh, journalist started talking about how babies learn to speak, just the fascination, uh, how fascinating it is how we as human beings learn how to speak. How, how that works in the mind of this, this developing little brain and this baby. And they were talking about something I thought was just really interesting at first. Uh, he, he said, have you ever noticed how a, a baby, when a baby starts talking, uh, it, you can't make any sense of what they're saying, and, and they don't even really, he thinks, make any sense out of what they're saying. It's like the, the child learns the melodic sounds of, of, of a parent talking, and you'll, you'll see a child as before they've even learned how to speak, and just up and down in inflections and not making any sense at all, not really even forming any words, but they've got this uh, whimsical kind of up and down tonations and all of these things going on. And, and he was talking about how the mind works uh, with those, those sounds to develop those patterns first. And then as the mind develops, as the brain develops, it's able to start learning the words and, and pronounce the words and, and, and fit that in. Uh, so I thought that was just really interesting and I wanted to, to learn more about it. Uh, but then Chris asked him, so what, what differentiates us from, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but, but uh, what differentiates us from our, our primate brothers, you know, in terms of the, the uh, uh, they were doing a, a special on uh, 
Gib Gibbon, Gibbons, those are little monkeys, Gibbons, Gibbons. I should have looked that up in my zoological books, uh, which I don't have. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, but Gibbons uh, and, and how, how they talk, and they, they, talk, they, they talked about how uh, with, with Gibbons monkey, the sounds of, of the monkeys are more up in the, higher up in the, the mouth, and they don't uh, make the p, b, dr, b, all of the, the sounds that we make with the, the lips. And, uh, of course, they don't have as big a lips. Well, they have big mouths, but they, don't, they, don't, they can't uh, accentuate uh, those, those kinds of things. So he began to talk about how, as, we, as we've researched this and, and looked in evolution, Darwin said this, and then, then he began to go into the details of why we as humans uh, are, were able to produce words and talk and converse where the Gibbons monkey doesn't have that degree of, of knowledge and ability and all of that. So they went into saying how well we can make those sounds and, and, and what happened with us is, you know, when we were in our early stages, you know, when our knuckles were dragging against the ground, we began to stand up. And as we stood up over time, the larynx from, the, from being way up in here where, you know, the, the noises are like monkeys ah, 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 up high. That was really a bad example. But, but anyway, but, but uh, developmentally, evolutionary-wise, our, our larynxes began to move down into here in the lower part, so we had more of a resonating voice. And, and as we pulled our knuckles, uh, our dra from dragging our knuckles off the ground and started to use our hands and our digits we be, we, there was a connection between the sensory learning that we were doing with these digits that came back to our mind that helped develop speech patterns. It was just idiocy, it just total idiocy. And I was listening to that, and, and I was thinking of, you remember the situation in Exodus where Moses is saying uh, to, to Yahweh, uh, the I am, uh, please do not send me. I I can't, I can't do this, I, I struggle with, uh, with speaking, I stutter, what, whatever uh, the situation that Moses uh, was, was struggling. He had, he had a lot of reasons why he didn't feel he was the one. And, and what did God say? Remember that? He said, Moses, who made your mouth? Who made, who made your mouth? I made your mouth. But he said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll have Aaron do this, but, but I'm going to work through you and, and we're going to make this happen. I made your mouth, and, and when you, you we look at uh, scripture down uh, down through the the Torah, uh, the the Pentateuch, we see Moses Moses doing a lot of speaking, uh, and God made his mouth, and and God made it work. God made our mouths, but when we come from back to the narrative, uh, we we can have incredible intelligence, and 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 again, it was fascinating listening to him talk about the way that the children begin to develop speech patterns. But but what, where does it come back to? It comes back to then this this thing of the the whole situation of of how we even developed uh, to become human beings. That is is such a false negative that we get to what we read and what we know well in Romans one. When, when the narrative is wrong, it, it lends, it, it leads, it, it's going to play out into all kinds of, of problems. Uh, verse, verse 18 of chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now Romans 1 Verse 19, because what may be known by, of God, it's, it's manifest, it's evidenced among, it's evident among them. For God has shown it to them. Uh, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We, 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 we go to school 
and, and these kinds of principles of the, the knuckle dragging and coming up and the larynx dropping down so that now we can produce speech, these are, these are, are foundational principles of a lot of aspects of science. I'm not saying that all science is that way, but, but, but I, I, I think our young people, I think our, our young adults uh, that are in college you know, recognize that when you come from this standpoint, that, that we don't have a, a basic narrative that God controls, the narrative that God says, I am the creator. I am the one who made mankind. I made mankind in my image to be like me because I'm bringing mankind to be with me for eternity as he yields to me and I change him to, uh, to be a part of my family. Uh, then it, it, it messes things up. The narrative is controlled in a different direction and then it brings us to verse 20, 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. And as a result, here's how the narrative plays out. that They become futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts are darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And then we see him discussing uh, the, the situation of, of, of humanity where man is to be with woman in a husband and wife relationship. And, and this is the, the, the opposite of what happens out of a narrative that is a false narrative. So critical for us uh, as young people going to... To, to college, going to school, to be grounded in the narrative of God. Because if we are not grounded in the narrative of God, then we can begin to look at some of these things that are going on in society, the societal changes that we see happening. And, and we, are, we are sinful, we are, we are prudes, we are bigots. If we say that this type of lifestyle, God calls an abomination. Uh, Truth is, is, is truth. There is, there is love and there is compassion. And we don't, we don't hate individuals that, that uh, have made these choices. We love them. God, God loves the entire world. We love, the, we love the world. We love the people of the world. We look forward to the opportunity when they will be called and have a chance to be in uh, the same situation that God is giving us now. But, we, but when we understand the narrative, we see how working with a false narrative, uh, being controlled by a narrative that is not godly, we see where that takes things and where it's taking society. Verse 28, and even as they did not, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to, to a debased mind to do these things which are not fitting. It, it's, it's all about the narrative. Let's look at one more narrative here as we uh, build on this. Let's go to Job now. Job. Young people recognize this is a huge technique of Satan the devil. And he is the God of this world and he works in all aspects of society. In all aspects of society to work in his narrative. We've got to be on guard for it. We've got to be grounded in God's word. Otherwise, we can get caught up in some of these narratives. Job 1, Job 1, we see again the, the ultimate, uh, if I could say, no, I could say the penultimate creator of the narrative. God is the ultimate creator of the narrative, and his narrative is true. Satan uh, under God and Christ as, as a being of evil is the penultimate narrative generator. And, but everything that he does is false. Everything that he does is, is false. Job 1, Job 1. Here we see God setting the narrative. Just, you know, uh, Satan, have you seen Job? Have you seen this individual? This individual, is a, is a, he fears God. He hates evil. Look, look at his life. Look at his example that he sets. And what does Satan say? Wait, wait, wait a second. You, you, you have set the narrative. The, the narrative that you set is, is so obvious that of course he's going to do this. You, you've, switched, you've made this narrative perfect for him. That's why. 
it, we, need, we need to change the narrative because here's the real, here's the real thing that's going on with Job. If, if you will take this hedge away from him and let him experience some, some real life, some real challenges, here's what he's going to do. He's going to curse you to his face. He's going to, he's going to hate you. He's going to detest you. And so, so do this. God allowed him to do so. God was still working through his true narrative because of his love for Job. Satan got, to, got what he thought was happening was that he was creating the narrative now, and it would play out uh, according to how he thought. Job didn't curse God. Now, now let's think about Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. As they were his friends, as, as we know the story, as they were his friends and, and they began conversing with Job over time, they had a narrative, didn't they? And they were working from a certain story of what they understood life to be. And their narrative was a, a godly person is going to be blessed. An ungodly person is going to, to have problems and going to have all of these things come down upon them. That is the narrative by which they lived. Was that a godly narrative? No. Godly says uh, the godly narrative is all who, who live who are, who are godly people are going to suffer persecution. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to suffer that. Now, uh, that's something that we see uh, uh, evidenced very clearly in the New Testament. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand that narrative. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. That's a, that's a psalm. Uh, but they, they, didn't, they didn't grasp that. They were working from this false narrative, and, and that was what they allowed to control them in their evaluation of Job. So that created problems. It created a completely inaccurate view of what was going on for Job. Job worked under the narrative that God is righteous, but God is hurting me here, so he's going after God, saying, God, you're doing this to me. Why are you doing that? Why are you being mean to me? Why are you being unfair to me? You know this. I'm not going to curse you. I'm not going to do this uh, against you, but you're really not treating me right here. Uh, Job, because Job was working from, from his narrative. God was bringing the whole, the, my, my personal feeling in looking at Job is God was bringing the whole thing to help Job understand the narrative that God, that God teaches mankind, the narrative that is the true narrative of Job's life. I will serve God. I will experience ups and downs. I am committed to God. This life is temporary. My life is in God's hands. I will serve him with all my heart, and I will remain thankful because I am man, and I am not God. And he is love. Uh, Job, Job grasped that through all that he, he, he experienced. Because God was following the true narrative to bring Job to this point of, of good in the end for Job. Okay, so, so with, that, with that said then, uh, let's, let's talk about a, a really fun subject here. Let's talk about the vaccine. It's one of my favorite subjects to discuss. I'm, I'm kidding slightly. No, I, I am kidding. Uh, but but as, as, we, as we think about the vaccine and all the discussions uh, that are out there about whether a person should get vaccine, vaccinated, whether a person should not get vaccinated, all that we see written out there in, in uh, various news sources about uh, the, the efficacy of the vaccine, the, the danger of the vaccine, and, and the sides that are, that are taken on that. One of the things that I, I really got a, got a chuckle out of is uh, two, uh, two conservatives, some of you that listen to talk radio would know these names, but uh, Mike Gallagher uh, is, is one of the talk radio guys, and there's another guy here locally, 660 AM, the answer, uh, Mark Davis, those, those two guys. Uh, those, those two guys are friends, they're both very, very conservative, and, and I, all of a sudden, I, sometimes one will be on one show kind of as a guest and sometimes the other on the other uh, show, but I was driving and just kind of flipping the, the, uh, flipping the dial. You don't do that anymore, do you? That's the old, um, 
old style, but I was pushing buttons and I, and I got to this discussion. And these guys were at each other's throats. I can't even remember which, which one was which, but, but one was saying how we need to have mandatory vaccines. And the other was saying, no, we should not make mandatory uh, vaccines, uh, you know, ma make it mandatory for all. But uh, the least we could do is have mandatory masks. And, and then these guys begin debating. And the, the most fascinating thing about it was each was trying to control the narrative. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily about trying to come to an understanding, but the, the, each was trying to put the other in a, in a in a, almost in a box and in a cage and Mark, you know this, you know this and this, you've seen this stats and this stats and Mark just wouldn't even hear it and then said, you know this, Mike, you're not even listening to the, what, the, what the truth is, and listen to what you're saying and each is really fighting to control the narrative uh, to get their, their point across. But we see that happening, we see that happening with, with, with the, the whole situation of of, of, of is the vaccine uh, something that is, is the best thing to do? Is it best to, to instead not take the vaccine, but, but take ivermectin and uh, uh, hydrochloroquine uh, to load up on zinc? Uh, what, what, what is the, the proper thing to do? What is the godly thing to do? What is the right narrative? Is it a wrong narrative to take a vaccine? Uh, what, what is the church's position on vaccines? Well, we've We've, we've permitted vaccines for, for years. Uh, you know, we think of certain vaccines, say for instance, the polio vaccine. Yes, there were individuals who took the polio vaccine and, and had a, or especially when it was the, the live form of, of the vaccine, and some caught polio and died from that. Thousands and thousands and thousands of lives have been saved from the polio vaccine. It's, it's, it's still a person's choice whether he or she, based on his or her situation, determines, I, I think it's best for me to take this vaccine or I think that it's best for me not to take this vaccine. But we can, we can get a little bit of information here and a little bit of information here and hear this narrative that this, this body is trying to, to, to generate and run or this body that this is, is generating and jump on that and that becomes our narrative, and we're on this mission to, uh, to get this message out, and we don't even know what we're talking about <laughs> sometimes. So it, it, is, it is so critical for us as God's people to recognize there is a narrative that is part of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, and there is a narrative that is God's narrative. And, uh, and in that, let, let, let's just... Let's just pick uh, another, another thought uh, with this. What, what about, what about this, this narrative? As we look at our nation and the situation of where our nation is presently and, and what uh, the concerns are for the future of this nation. This nation uh, was founded on a, a freedom of speech, the, the right to assemble, uh, you know, peaceably uh, to assemble, uh, freedom of religion. Uh, those those narratives. That is a narrative that is foundational for this country, is it not? I mean, that, uh, and, and most would say that that, that is one of the, the narratives that is critical uh, for the success of this nation. Uh, here is another statement. Have you ever heard this? What do you think about this narrative? Is this a narrative that you possess. Think about this. Our nation is in a battle in which we are about to lose the freedoms upon which this great country was founded. Do you, do you uh, adhere to that narrative? Do you proclaim that narrative? Is that a narrative that is part and parcel with who you are? If it is, is that God's narrative? Is it? Is it God's narrative? Let's uh, think about uh, that as we, as we move forward. We are very blessed to live in this country, but we are also strangers living in a foreign land whose citizenship is in a different kingdom. What is God's narrative? 
God's narrative is, is, is central. It's based on love. God's narrative has a variety of c- components. But some, here are some of those components. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> love God with all your being. Follow him. Obey him. Trust in him. Love the world, not as in the, 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 the pride of life and uh, lust of the flesh and all of that, but, but to love mankind uh, as God loves the world, John, uh, as we know, John 3.16. One of the narratives of God is to seek first his kingdom, seek first his kingdom, and to also seek his righteousness. That is what we must seek First, another narrative of God is my kingdom is not of this world. (laughs) That is a godly narrative. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3. This was a a theme of the conference uh, as as they they talked uh, this this past week. Nearly every message covered this point of of the church uh, moving forward in these... uh, turbulent times. Here is another narrative of God, a narrative that, that God's people will, will keep very, very close to them, and that is to esteem others higher than ourselves. Notice how these perilous times, a passage that we've read many times, uh, and, and what, what's going on in our society today, and what's going on around us, what was going on at the time then, what, what appears to be ramping up now. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, But know this, that in the last days these perilous or these, these times of stress uh, are, are going to, to come. Mr. Kylo talked about how that stress as, as it goes into this, these are, these are internal things. Yes, there are perilous times happening around us, but the, what's going on inside is, is what is, is a huge part of these perilous times as well. What's going on inside of mankind it, it, at the heart of the matter? He says men will be lovers of themselves. They'll be lovers of money. They'll be boasters, proud and blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, in a state of unthankfulness, unholy, unloving. Verse, verse 3 has this next statement, unforgiving. I, I like the, the, uh, the margin rendering here, uh, irreconcilable. We see it so much in society today. We see it happening in marriages. We see it happening in relationships where, where folks are unable to reconcile. They're irreconcilable. And I submit to you that in part it stems from the narrative that, that each individual has set. When, when two people, when two people are, are following God's narrative, even though there are differences, two people in the faith growing in God's love have differences of opinion and, and are, are, are in a state of conflict, it can be worked out. If we follow God's narrative, it, it, there, there can be peace that can be made. When that is not the case with one or both parties, we, we move into this state of, of, of being irreconcilable, un, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He says, from these kinds of people that have a form of godliness also, but deny its power, he says, turn away from them. Even talks about how some are able to create a false narrative here. Look at, look at this in verse 6. For if of this sort are those who creep into households and they make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts. The narrative that they are, that they are so caught up in is contrary to God that they can easily be taken captive in a sense, spiritually, and, and, and led down into all kinds of lusts. Here we are as a world around us always learning and never able to come to that knowledge of the truth. I submit to you again that it is because they, they, are, not, they are not following this narrative of God. You know, if, if we go off, this is a, a point that Mr. Kylo made this past week uh, in, in his presentation about keeping our focus. He, he stated, don't be taken off message 
We are representatives of Jesus Christ here on this earth as his ambassadors. We represent his message. We must not allow ourselves to be taken off message. So many areas that, that can take us off message. Bits of good, bits of evil, uh, bits of truth that, that are out there of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We as God's people cannot be taken off message. We can't allow that. He made this statement. I thought it was insightful. If we go off God's message, we will become divided and will begin listening to the messages of this world. Without unity, we will be conquered. The challenge of maintaining unity is, is ever before us with one accord, with one heart, and, and with one soul, with, with great power. They preached God's word. Times of peril serve to forge, forge together one heart and one soul with us together. They, they serve to forge one, uh, one heart and one soul together, or they serve to fracture. And it is hugely dependent upon the narrative that we allow to guide us. Uh, so, so true. So let's look at one example here. Uh, let's look at one example of a narrative. Now, on this one, this is a, a pretty radical narrative, all right? This is a narrative coming from a white person. I think I'm white. I've got a little bit of different things in me, uh, I think, but I, I think I'm primarily white. Uh, but let's, let's read this. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Here we were uh, in Romans, in the time of, of the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the, the fourth uh, beast of its, uh, will have its various resurrections, its resurrection to come at the end, its resurrection, final resurrection that comes at the end of it all, and where people go into captivity again. There were slaves in the land at the time. What is one of the most heinous or most deplorable things that we can think of in this nation that we see, that we, we think about? The slavery. I mean, so, so much of what, what happened uh, with slavery and, and the issues that are going on right now. Uh, I, I hate slavery. I detest slavery. But look at, look at what Paul says about slavery. Colossians, Colossians 3. Is this, is this your narrative? Is, is this my narrative? This is God's narrative, living in this present evil world. Bond servants, those of you who are, are enslaved as servants in this empire at this time. Well, no, wait a second. We're, we're not in that kind of empire now. Well, what if we were? What if, what if we are not taken to the place of, of, of safety? What if we are uh, found uh, to be ones that uh, Satan goes to make war with the rest of her offspring, and we're not ones that are taken to a place to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time? Uh, and we find ourselves in a situation of, of slavery. Bond servants obey in all things your masters. Well, wait, 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 say this, this, was, this was in the Roman Empire. That, that was back then. The Roman Empire will have its final, final resurrection. What, 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 will God's, what are God's people to do in that situation? Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but do so in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do as, as, a, ser as a servant, as a slave, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. <laughs> He's saying here, get the narrative. The narrative is we're living in this present evil world. And if you find yourself in a situation of a slave, serve heartily because you serve the Lord, because you see the big picture. You see that this life is temporary, and if I'm in this situation, I am in this situation. God can get me out of this situation. He can keep me in this situation, and he can use me because in, in any way that he pleases because I serve him, and I know what the inheritance is. I know what my future is. That's what I'm all about. That's my focus. He says the same to masters. There were masters in the church. There were slaves in the church. 
Verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. You're, you're a slave. You're a slave to the great God. As, as a master in that situation, he's saying, see ourselves as, as slaves to the great God. We answer to him, so we better do what we do heartily to him because he is ultimately our master. He doesn't just say that there. He says this in, in various places, uh, lest we think, oh, that's just a one-off. Maybe Paul was having a, a, a kind of a lapse in thought here and, and got into this whole slave analogy, and uh, the, the slave analogy breaks down because it's such an evil thing. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? He doesn't have to then become circumcised, he says. Verse 19, circumcision, in terms of the, the circumcision of the heart, that's what the matter is. It, it's all about receiving God's Holy Spirit. It's not about a physical cutting off of the foreskin here. Uh, verse 19, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's the narrative. That's the narrative that God wants his people on. That's the one that he wanted them on then. Verse 20, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, well, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave needs to view it from this perspective, God says. This, this is my perspective. This is not man's perspective. This is God's pers perspective. A slave should consider himself the Lord's free, free man. That, that, that is so opposite of, of our nation today. That, that it, it's, it's opposite. It's opposite of that. Now, it, can, I, can I say this because I am a white man that, that's not ever been in a situation of slavery? Well, yeah, you can say that because you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be viewed in this way or this way by others. No, I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like. And, and, and I fully empathize and fully understand with mankind's view of, of the races and seeing others as superior. But, but regardless of that, I must, whether I'm white, whether I'm Latino, whether I'm uh, black, whether I'm Asian, I must look at things from God's perspective. I must see mankind, I must see society, not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I must see society from the tree of life. And the tree of life says, I, my inheritance is with God. If I am free, I need to consider myself a servant of the master. If I am a, a master Jesus Christ, Christ's slave, as he says here in verse 22. I, I need to see myself as being bought at a price, but I am not to become slaves of men, slaves of the depravity of man, slaves of the depravity of man's way of thinking, which is bound up in in falseness. I, I've got to see things through God's eyes. I've got to see things from the truth of God, from the narrative of God, and as a result, I am free. I am free. Otherwise, I become enslaved to, as a slave of men in terms of mankind's teaching. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. Another passage, let's uh, uh, go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. I never thought of Ephesians 6 uh, in this way until just reading this in, in, uh, here recently. But here he makes another, uh, Paul makes one more statement as he writes to those in Ephesus because he is creating the narrative. And notice, notice the, the placement of where he uses this thing about slavery with the true narrative. Think about this. Bondservants, be obedient, verse 5. Bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, and do so with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as, as, as if you were serving to Christ. It, it's, I'm serving this person as, as to Christ, a, a sincerity. I'm really serving. I'm, I'm doing this in front of Christ. I'm serving him. He says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Jesus Christ, 
I am a slave to this master that I serve in, in this, where, this, this time period here, he says, doing the will of God from the heart. I've, I've got to have this mindset. I've got to work from this narrative. I do it with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he'll receive the same from the Lord, whether he's slave or free. Masters, you, you, you do the same things to them, giving up your threatenings, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So here we, we think about this nation. And again, I am not for slavery in our nation. Please understand, Burnett's not trying to reinstitute slavery in America. <laughs> but but, but, but think, about, think about how God views this here. And then what does God say next through Paul? What's the next thing that he says in Scripture? What's the next passage that's discussed? The true narrative. The, the real narrative that's going on in our world today. We as God's people, don't, don't get caught up in this. Don't get caught up in this battle, in this battle. The battle, the real narrative that's going on is, is against what we wrestle as God's people. We've got to be strong in the Lord. We've got to be strong in the power of his might. We've got to put on the whole ar armor of God that we can stand against these wiles of the devil. This, this great uh, penultimate uh, narrative creator and how he tries to twist us and get us caught up in this and caught up in this. No, we're fighting against wicked spirits in high places uh, and take up the whole armor of God to stand against that. That's, that's our battle. That's our narrative. So when we see chaos going on in the world, we as God's people pull back and we see what is really going on here. We strive to see it as Christ saw it when Satan was coming at him. How are we doing on that? How are you and I doing on that? How are we battling that? It is so, so critical as we go forward. A couple of final points as we, as we wrap up here. Let's get to a, a, a true narrative and set up the two narratives to conclude by going back just a few chapters. Let's go to Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 to wrap up. You know, as we go forward, it is going to be be more and more difficult for us to discern what is happening and, and why this is happening here and this is happening here. But I, I submit to you again, brethren, if, if we can pull back and, and keep the right narrative, if we can keep God's narrative, God's true story of what's going on, we're going to be all right. We're, we're going to be just fine, and God will get us through whatever lies ahead. But also, if, if we don't, if we get, allow ourselves to get pulled over here by pulled, and pulled over here, and even, even the situation of this whole thing of what's really going on here, the whole conspiracy thing. Yeah, yeah Satan's way is a, a conspiracy. I, I get that. But we can also get sucked into various conspiracy theories that are out there and, and not realize that, well, I think because I see this hidden thing that nobody else sees about this and this going on, that I see it from the right narrative. And it's my job then to let everybody know this is really what's going on. I know you can't prove it, but, but it's this and this and this and this. And this is really going on. We may get caught up in a narrative that is just another one of the many narratives of Satan the devil that is all tied to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I would ask each of us, as I ask me, as I try to navigate in the future uh, ahead through all the things that we're going to face, am I staying and am I focusing on the narrative, the true narrative, the think on these things, the good things, and begin to let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, rule in our hearts. Uh, it, is, it is the only way. Okay, uh, final narrative here as, as we look at this, the, the two narratives that are there. Ephesians 2. Here's, here's the narrative that the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, is working. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. God's people must recognize those courses, those narratives that the prince of the power of this air, of the air, is working. It, it's the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. 
among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of, of the flesh and of the mind. And of the mind. We can get caught up in that and, and, get, and, and get filled by the, the desires of, of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, just as others. But that is not the narrative to which God has called us. It is, it is much different. Let's look at Ephesians 1, verse 15. Ephesians 1, verse 15. Therefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's the, here's the narrative. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that, that we may know what is the hope of his calling. That, that's so critical to know that hope, to be, to be focused on the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, uh, and, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and now he's at the right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus Christ is far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. That's the narrative. He is the one who is in charge. That's the one upon whom I focus. God put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Please take time to think about the narratives that define you. Think about those. Think about where we live, who we are, what what angles Satan is going to try to get at us to the degree, brethren, that we, we fight against that and allow God, the true God, the God of truth, to control the narrative, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay.